Hi, and welcome to another episode of Z Notes Live. We have Afreen with us today, and we will be discussing the topic of human nutrition. Over to you, Afreen. Hello. Uh, so human nutrition is chapter seven in IGCSE biology, and it has five main parts. So we're going to start with the first part, that is human diet. Um, so we'll look at the syllabus now. Uh, basically, the syllabus dictates that you should know what's the balanced diet and you should know some of the main nutrients that our bodies need. And we should, um, this syllabus, uh, the syllabus needs you to know two main deficiency diseases. Uh, to start with, like I already said, you need to know what's a balanced diet. Um, a balanced diet is basically a diet in which you're getting all the right nutrients, uh, nutrients in the right proportions. So nothing's too much and nothing's too little. Uh, so the your diet varies. A human diet varies according to someone's age, or um, whether they're pregnant or not, and their activity levels, and even their genders. So um, some nutrients are needed more uh, in some certain stages and less in other stages. So for children below 12, uh, calcium is needed more. For teenagers. Uh, this is where you need to have the highest calorie intake because this is where you're going through puberty and everything and then adults need um, a balanced meal with less calories unless you have um, Unless you're a highly active adult and you're um, doing highly laborious work Then obviously your calorie intake should be higher. So like I said, it depends uh, depend, uh, It varies depending on your occupation your age your height your um, your build uh, and your activity levels. Um, so there are certain conditions caused by eating an unbalanced diet, and there's overnutrition, there's undernutrition, and that, which is basically just eating foods in incorrect proportions. So overnutrition is when uh, you have a balanced diet, but you're eating too much of everything, and undernutrition is when you're eating too little food. So this is kind of self-explanatory. Uh, and next we have the main nutrition and uh, nutrients so there are seven main nutrients that um IGCC biology needs you to know and there's carbohydrates fats proteins vitamins cal um, minerals fiber and water so there are seven main um uh proteins uh, nutrients so carbohydrates is needed for energy so we've already discussed this in previous chapters there's um metabolic reactions happening inside cells which uh, releases energy from food molecules and uh, glucose is a reactant in that uh, so that's glucose comes from carbohydrates then there's fats fats is also a source of energy um, it also helps in building materials and it's an energy store it gives you insulation allows buoyancy and um, takes part in making hormones and then there's proteins. Proteins, again, there's energy building materials like tissues. Um, enzymes are proteins. Hemoglobin is proteins. There's structural materials like muscles that are made of proteins. And there's hormones that are made of proteins. And antibodies, also proteins. So there's just all the main stuff that's going inside your body. The, the processes and the chemicals that keep you alive and healthy. A lot of them have to do, ha use proteins or are proteins. And then there's vitamins. So for now, you need to know about vitamin C and vitamin D. Vitamin C is needed for uh, protecting cells from aging and production of fibers, while vitamin D is needed for absorption of calcium. And then there's minerals. For minerals, you need to know calcium and iron. Uh, calcium is needed for development and maintenance of bones and teeth. So um, you basically develop strong bones and teeth, and then you need to keep taking in calcium to maintain it throughout your life. Um, and then there's iron. Iron is um, obviously needed for making hemoglobin. So that was the minerals part. And then there's fiber. Fiber uh, provides bulk to your food, and so it helps in peristalsis and basically helps in pushing feces out. Um, so a lack of fiber in diet would cause constipation. Um, and then there's water. So water is a uh, solvent for transport. It's needed in chemical reactions inside your cells. So water is um, a no-brainer. It's needed for keeping us alive and healthy. 
Okay, so over here we're discussing the deficiencies. There's vitamin C. Uh, a lack of vitamin C would cause scurvy, uh, which is basically um, loss of teeth and pale skin and sunken eyes. Uh, vitamin C is needed for healthy skin, healthy uh, gums, nails. So uh, yeah, that's what vitamin C is important for. And there's vitamin D. Uh, the, uh, vitamin D deficiency disease is called rickets. And basically, you have weak bones and weak teeth because uh, without vitamin D, um, you're not a, your body's not able to absorb calcium. So ultimately, it leads to weak bones and weak um, teeth. Calcium, once again, rickets. Uh, and also, it, um, it gives you weak bones, same like vitamin D. Um, furthermore, it gives you, uh, it helps it prevents healthy blood clotting because in the process of blood clotting, calcium ions are actually a very important comp component. So without calcium ions, your blood won't be able to uh, clot properly. And if you um, get a cut, you have excessive bleeding and you may need to see a healthcare professional for a small cut. Then there's iron. Iron, a deficiency of iron leads to anemia. Uh, symptom uh, when you have anemia a person with anemia is less more likely to have to be more fatigued uh, so because they have less iron so um, there's less hemoglobin so there's less oxygen transported so there's less respiration um, occurring throughout your body because oxygen is a reactant for respiration and uh, overall you'll have less energy so you have more fatigue Okay, so this is malnutrition. Uh, malnutrition is basically um, eating food in incorrect proportions, eating, uh, consuming nutrients in incorrect proportions. So starvation is when you're not eating um, much. So you lose strength, uh, strength and you, um, if uh, the case is very severe, the person ends up dying because of lack of food. Uh, the next one is coronary heart disease. Um, eating too much fat, uh, which are rich in saturated fatty acids and cholesterol. Um, this is something, this piece of detail is not important, but what you need to know is eating too much fat may lead to heart diseases because they clog your coronary arteries. Coronary arteries are basically um, arteries on your heart. This is something you'll learn more about in chapter nine, I think, but that's the uh, transport in humans chapter. Next up, we have constipation. Uh, lack of roughages in food. So that's, that basically means lack of fiber in food. Um, so there's less bulk in your food and uh, peristyla peristylysis isn't um, as properly stimulated as it should, as, as it would have been with fiber. So uh, it takes time and effort for your feces to pass through. Next up, we have obesity. Uh, obesity uh, happens from eating too much uh, nutrients, especially fats and carbohydrates. So these nutrients are stored in your body, um, mostly in the form of fat, and this leads to an increase in body weight. So this can increase chances of heart attacks, strokes, joint pain, uh, mobility impairment, and high blood pressure. So that was the first part. That was human diet. Now we're talking about the digestive system. So we look more into like peristalysis and stuff. So uh, the syllabus needs you to know the different organs uh, involved in the digestive system and the associated organs. So these, these, these are not organs where food necessarily passes through, but they're still vital in digestion. And you need to know about different processes that's occurring throughout. Okay, so first of all, there's key vocabulary. You need to memorize this stuff. There's no way to get around it, but um, memorizing becomes easier when you understand what's happening. So ingestion is uh, basically that's food, that's drink, um, into the body through the mouth. Simple terms, it's eating. Eating is called ingestion. Uh, then there's ingestion. Ingestion is passing out a food that has not been uh, digested as feces through the anus. So um, the, what comes in must go up. Uh, so the part of the food which has not been which has not been used up or absorbed by your body uh, is formed into feces and it passes out through the anus. So that's called ingestion. 
digestion is uh, the breakdown of large and soluble food molecules into small water soluble molecules. Uh, using chem mechanical and chemical processes, we will look into the mechanical and chemical processes further into the presentation. But digestion is basically um, your body breaks down large pieces of food into um, smaller pieces that are soluble in water so that they can be used in respiration and other processes in the body. And then there's absorption. Absorption is the movement of nutrients from the intestines into the blood. So um, the food is present in your intestines and that's where lo lots of um, absorption of nutrients is occurring. So these nutrients are absorbed from the intestines into the blood so that it can be transported around the body and reach where, and so that the nutrients reach where they need to. And assimilation is when the nutrients are taken up by the cells and used up. So the nutrients molecule become part of the cell. Uh, yeah, that's that. And then there's, okay, so we're looking at the organs now. Um, so the first organ is obviously mouth. Um, the first part of the digestive system is the mouth. Um, mouth contains teeth, which is used for mechanical digestion. Uh, over here, the food is mixed with saliva. Our saliva contains an enzyme called amylase, which basically breaks down carbohydrates. And um, mouth is where the ingestion takes place, like we already discussed. Um, important thing about amylase, it's an enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates. And if you'll notice, when you chew bread for a bit longer than you're supposed to, you, uh, it will taste sweeter. That's because the amylase in your saliva is breaking down the carbo in the starch into um, simple sugars. That's uh, so you can taste the sweetness of it. Uh, next up, we have uh, esophagus. Uh, it's a tube-shaped organ, and it uses peristalsis, uh, same like your colon. Peristalsis is basically when your muscles contract to push something through the pipe. So this is something that's happening in the esophagus. Um, when you swallow food, there's peristalsis occurring in the esophagus to push the food down from the mouth to the stomach. Uh, the stomach has sphincter muscles to control movement into and out of the um, stomach. So that um, because it, these muscles are very important in the stomach because uh, your stomach contains acids. Which, is, which could be really harmful when they enter your esophagus. So there's muscles that control what's going in and out of your stomach. And stomach also has pepsin. Pepsin is a protease. A protease is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. Um, and pepsin is present in the stomach because the stomach has the ideal conditions for the pep uh, pepsin to, take, to um, act on the food nutrients, on the food molecules. And uh, this is something we have looked into in chapter five. That's uh, the enzymes chapter. Um, so pepsin basically breaks down proteins into peptides and, it, uh, and the acid in the stomach helps to kill bacteria with, um, yeah, with the acid that's present. And they also have elastic walls so they can expand and contract according to the food capacity that's currently inside the stomach. Okay, so this is a diagram. So we've looked at the mouth. Uh, if you look at the first, uh, can you go back to that slide, the diagram? Yeah. Uh, so if you start from the top, there's the mouth. Uh, we've discussed what it does. It contains teeth for mechanical digestion. Uh, or it has saliva, which contains the myelase to break down carbohydrates. And then next we have esophagus. This is where peristalsis occurs to push food down from the mouth to the stomach. And then we discuss stomach, which contains muscles, sphincter muscles that control movement in and out of the stomach. Um, the stomach contains acids uh, to kill bacteria and to provide optimum to, uh, optimum pH levels for the enzyme peptid, uh, pepsin, which breaks down proteins into peptides. Uh, next, we'll look at uh, the different, the next parts. Uh, can you change the slide? Yeah. So there's the small intestine. A small intestine is a tube-shaped organ, once again, like the esophagus. 
Uh, however, uh, this model design is quite long. It's very, very long. And it's, so it's split into two main parts. There's the duodenum and there's the ileum. So the duodenum uh, can, has uh, optimum pH levels for other enzymes like lipase. That's the enzyme that breaks down lipids uh, into fatty acids and glycerol. There's um, trypsin. This is also a, another type of protease that breaks down uh, that breaks down proteins into smaller uh, amino acids. And there's mal maltase and there's uh, amylase that breaks amylase breaks down starch to uh, maltase. And there's maltose and there's maltase that breaks down maltose to simple sugars. So this is all a bit confusing, but uh, there's a table coming up that basically shows where the enzymes are formed, where they're acting, and what are the substances they're breaking down, and what are the results. So, however, you need to know that um, our livers, they produce a chemical called bile, and the bile is released in the duodenum. So the, the, the bile has two main purposes. The bile is basic in nature to provide optimum pH uh, conditions for the enzymes present here and it emulsifies fats. So it brings it breaks down large fat droplets into smaller droplets so that the air surface area is increased for enzyme action to take place, uh, thus increasing the rate of the reaction. Next part of the small intestine is called the ileum. Ileum has maltase, which breaks down maltose to glucose. So maltose is the uh, substrate and glucose is the product, and maltase is the enzyme. And ileum is where the most of the absorption in this whole process takes place. So it's equipped with villi and microvilli. So villi is basically ridges that look like this on the small on the walls of the small intestine. So so that the area of the surface area of the small intestine is increased, and there's maximum absorption uh, of nutrients taking place. After the small intestine, there's the large intestine. Large intestine is once again a tube-shaped organ composed of two main parts. There's the colon and then there's the rectum. The colon is the organ where um, nutrients are further absorbed. So there's minerals and vitamins being absorbed here, and water is reabsorbed from the waste to maintain the body's water levels. So basically, um, uh, this is a bit like equilibrium. Uh, so uh, depending on the water body's water level, the feces would be more or less watery because of how much water is reabsorbed in the colon. Next up, we have rectum, and rectum is where the feces is temporarily stored. Uh, after that, we have the anus, and anus is a ring of muscle that controls when feces is released. Uh, so here's the diagram again. So uh, after the stomach, we have the duodenum. And we have the ileum. After the ileum, we have the colon, and then we have the rectum and anus. So that's the digestive system. Um, now we will look at some of the associated organs. So first of all, we have salivary glands that's found um, around the mouth. They produce saliva, which contains amylase um, to break down carbohydrates once again. And the saliva also helps our food slide down our esophagus more easily. After that, we have the pancreas. Pancreas produces pancreatic juices, which contains amylase, once again. Uh, it also contains trypsin and lipase and hydrogen carbonate. So um, amylase, trypsin, and lipase are all enzymes. Uh, and we will look at their specific functions uh, further into the slides. Uh, but you should also remember it from chapter 5. And hydrogen carbonate is to maintain the pH levels that is um, optimum for those enzymes. Uh, then we have the liver. Liver produces bile. Bile, um, bile is once again it emulsifies fats and uh, it op creates optimum pH conditions in the duodenum. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. But it also like carries out conversion of amino acids uh, into um, different products by the process of deamination. Uh, and this is something you learn in another chapter um, in Magistacy Biology. And liver is also responsible for the breakdown of alcohol and other toxins. 
and the removal of um, old red blood cells and the storage of iron. But for now, you need to know that liver produces bile. That's really it. Because other processes, you'll learn more about it in the coming chapters. Um, then there's the gallbladder. Gallbladder stores the bile produced for, by the liver. Okay, so those were the associated organs. Now we have physical digestion. And the syllabus uh, states that the syllabus states that you need to describe, be able to describe what is physical digestion. Uh, you need to know that physical digestion is needed to increase the surface area of the food, and you need to be able to um, identify different hum uh, different types of human teeth, and then you need to uh, describe the structure of human teeth and um, the uh, the functions of the type of teeth and the the function of the stomach in physical digestion and also you need to know about what bile does so this is some of it you already must have known by now but let's get into it uh, physical digestion is the breakdown of food into smaller pieces without chemical change to the food molecules so it's really like taking a knife and cutting up an apple into smaller pieces so you're not really changing what the product is you're just cut, taking a big apple and cutting it into small small pieces so that's what physical digestion is about it takes the bigger um, food molecules that you ingest and it uh, breaks them down into smaller pieces that's easier to digest. So um, think about what's happening inside your mouth. You take a bite of your food and then you chew it down to uh, break it down into smaller pieces that's easier to swallow. And then physical digestion is important because it increases the surface area for the, of the food for a maximum uh, amount of enzymes uh, to act on the uh, food molecules so that the rate of chemical digestion increases and um, the mo most of the molecules are properly absorbed. Bile is a chemical that is produced by the liver and it is stored in the gallbladder and its main roles are to emulsify fats and increase surface area for the in action of enzymes. So this is actually really important. You need to know what bile is and why it's used, um, because uh, this could be a common quest. This is a common question in paper four, and I've had it in both of my mocks. So I would, I really would suggest you um, learn this. Uh, and then, okay, then there's the role of stomach in physical digestion. Phys a stomach basically churns food, uh, so there's not much that's happening here. Your stomach just turns food, and that's why your stomach is taking part in physical digestion. Also, physical digestion is also called mechanical digestion. So if you see mechanical or physical, try not to get confused, because they're pretty much the same thing. Physical digestion is mechanical digestion. OK, so here's the type of teeth. Uh, there are four types of teeth that you need to know about that we have. Um, there's incisor, there's canine, there's premolar, and there's molar. So the incisor uh, tooth, the teeth, uh, the, the front teeth that we have, they're rectangular shape and they have they're sharp like a chisel for um, cutting and biting. So this is with what uh, th these are the teeth you're using to bite food and um, tearing it off the larger piece that you're holding in hand. Uh, and then there's the canine. Canine is sharp pointed uh, and it's used for holding and cutting food. So this is what you're tearing meat with if you eat meat, because meat is usually a bit tougher. So um, that's what you're using canine for. And there's the premolar. Um, premolar and the molar are pretty much the same. They're blunt and they're used for chewing food. However, the premolar has one root, while the molar teeth have two roots. OK, so now you need to know the structure of tooth. Uh, of a tooth. The first layer is the topmost layer is called enamel and it's the strongest tissue in the body and it's made from calcium salts. The next layer is called, um, okay, it's not layer wise, but there's a layer called cement uh, and it basically helps to anchor tooth. Um, I'm gonna go layer wise. So the, the topmost layer is enamel, it's the strongest tissue in the body made from calcium salts. And then the next layer is dentine. Dentine um, is basically calcium salts deposited on a framework of collagen fibers. 
um, you do not know this one in so much detail, but you do not have to be able to identify it in a diagram. So the first layer is enamel, the second layer is dentine, and the third layer is pulp cavity. Pulp cavity contains tooth producing cells, blood vessels, and nerve endings which detect pain. So um, when you have cavities, when you have cavities and um, basically they eat away at your teeth, the first two layers and expose the pulp cavity and that's why it hurts so much when um you, whenever you touch it or even if you don't touch it because all these uh sensitive nerve endings are open uh and then there's the cement the cement basically helps to anchor to it to the gums um teeth are embedded in bones and gums once again this is a statement you need to be able to make teeth are embedded in bones and gums um and yeah that's that's the structure so that was physical digestion. Now we're at chemical digestion. So the syllabus states that you need to know, uh, you can be able to de describe what's chemical digestion. You need to know what the role of chemical digestion is. And you need to describe the function of different enzymes um, involved in the process of digestion. And then you need to know where each enzyme is produced and where they act. And then you need to know the functions of different um, acids and bases um, um, that's used throughout the digestive system uh, and then you need to know the digest digestion of starch, the digestion of protein and why, once again why bile is used. So bile, if you notice now, it's a recurring theme, it's, it's, it's a recurring topic, it's uh, really important and I cannot stress this enough. Okay, so chemical digestion. You need to know this by heart. Chemical digestion is the breakdown of large, large insoluble molecules into small soluble molecules. So you should have noticed the difference between physical and chemical digestion, digestion right off the bat. Um, in physical digestion, there's no change happening to the food molecules. However, in chemical digestion, there is a change. There's a chemical change to the food molecules. So the insoluble food molecules become smaller soluble molecules that can be uh, dissolved in water and used for different body uh, functions. Uh, once again, next, the next part talks about hydrochloric acid. Hydrochloric acid is present in gastric juices, that's your stomach juices. Um, it's present in order to kill harmful microorganisms in food and providing an acidic pH for optimum enzyme activity. So um, yeah, killing microorganisms and optimum pH, that's the main purpose of hydrochloric acid and bile. Bile is an alkaline mixture that neutralizes the acidic mixture of food and gastric juices entering the duodenum. So you have to know where the bile is acting. It's the duodenum. That's the first part of the small intestine. Um, and it also provides a suitable pH for enzyme mixture. Okay. Uh, the different enzymes. There's lipase. Lipase breaks down fats and oils into fatty acids and glycerol. Amylase breaks down starch to maltose. Maltase breaks down maltose to glucose. Um, you do not need to know the next part. And proteases break down protein to amino acids. Uh, when you talk about proteins, we need to know about two specific proteases. Uh, that's the pepsin and the trypsin. The pepsin breaks down protein in the acidic conditions of the stomach and the trypsin breaks down protein in the alkaline condition of the small intestine. So you need to know about the difference of the two uh, pro proteases. There's pepsin and there's trypsin. Pepsin thrives in acidic conditions and it's found in the stomach, while trypsin thrives in alkaline conditions and is found in the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. Okay, here's the table I was talking about. Uh, you need to know this by heart because this is, an, once again, an important question in paper four. Uh, so the am enzyme amylase, it's produced in the pancreas and it works in the small intestine. Once again, amylase produced in the sal salivary glands and it works in the mouth. So there are two uh, places where amylase is produced and there are two sites of action for amylase. And you need to know about both of them for this chapter. The next one is pepsin. Pepsin is produced in the stomach and it works in the stomach. Trypsin is produced in the pancreas and it works in the small intestine. Um, lipase is produced in the uh, pancreas and it works in the small intestine. So to help you um, memorize this more easily, if you'll notice, all the enzymes which is produced in the pancreas, it works in the small intestine. 
and the only um the only enzymes that is not produced in the enzyme uh, pancreas is amylase and pepsin and that's the salivary gland it's produced in the salivary gland and the stomach respectively so amylase and pepsin you need you might need to memorize while the others you can just uh, look at it figure out the pattern and easily memorize it <clears throat> okay so this is the last part of human nutrition uh, it's called absorption and the syllabus the syllabus for this one is quite small actually. You need to know that small intestine is where uh, most of this is happening, where water is being absorbed, and the significance of villi and microvilli and the structure of villus and the roles of capillaries and bacteria in a villi. Okay, so first and foremost, the first statements that they have made in the syllabus the small intestine is the region where nutrients are absorbed. So this is something you need to know. Um, small intestine is the region where nutrients are absorbed. Most water is absorbed from the small intestine, um, but a lot of it is also reabsorbed in the colon. Um, so these two points are important because there will be questions like where is most of the nutrients absorbed and where is a lot of the water reabsorbed. So you need to know that it's small intestine or it's the colon. Okay, and then the small intestine is folded into many villi. Um, uh, there will be a diagram of the villi in the next slide. So it is basically used to increase the surface area for absorption. So when there's a large surface area, um, maximum absorption of nutrients can be guaranteed. That's why it's so important. And each villus will have tiny folds, which are called microvilli. So they also have the same purpose. They're increasing the surface area of one villus. So um, it, the small intestine is hugely efficient because of the insane amount of surface area that's, produce, uh, that's available inside which allows the absolute maximum absorption of nutrients. So um, very little nutrients is wasted as pieces. Um, yeah, so more surface area means more absorption. And that's something you should know. And then there's the capillary and the lacteal. So both of these are um, found inside a villus. And the capillary is responsible for transporting glucose and amino acids, while lacteals are uh, responsible for transporting uh, absorbing fatty acids in this room. So this is the villi, stru uh, villi structure. Uh, the small intestine is folded into many villi for increased surface area, and each one has uh, smaller folds called microvilli. And if you'll see inside, you can see the lacteals and the capillaries. Um, the capillaries are connected to the veins and arteries to allow ex exchange of blood. And yeah, that's it. We'll look at some questions now. So this is May, June 2018. The diagram shows part of the elementary canal. Where is most of the water absorbed? Um, so if you'll remember, um, like I said, this, is, this could be a common question. Um, so this could be either C or D because that, you know, that's where the absorption of nutrients is happening. So let's look at the next slide. And the answer is, um, let's look at the next slide. The answer is D because if you remember, that's where most of the nutrients are being absorbed. Uh, the C is the colon, and that's where some of the water is reabsorbed. So this could be a trick question because um, a lot of people actually do get confused between where the water is being absorbed. But you have to remember most of the nutrients and most of the water is being absorbed in the small intestine. So the correct answer is D. Okay, um, this is February, March, twenty eighteen. Paper two, um, in which part of the body of a mammal does mechanical digestion occur? Mechanical digestion is when um, the food, chem the chemical composition of the food doesn't change, it just becomes smaller. So the correct answer is the mouth because it contains the teeth and um, we are chewing food to make it into, to break it into smaller pieces. Okay, this is February, March 2016, paper two. Uh, the diagram shows part of the elementary canal and associated organs. Which structure uh, in secrete enzymes that digest proteins? <clears throat> so the uh, digestion of proteins is happening in the stomach and in the small intestine. However, these enzymes are being produced in the stomach and the pancreas. So that the correct options are V and W. V and W, that's option C. And that's the correct answer. <clears throat> and that's it. That's chapter 7, Human Nutrition. 
Thank you so much for your time today, Afreen, and we hope you understood the chapter of human nutrition better. Um, our social media handles will pop up on the next slide and you can follow them. Thank you so much for your time.